ask you a question, and that is, what is in your life's blueprint? This is Jeremy Till, the host of the Operator Podcast. We'll be taking you on a journey with us, interviewing some of the top performers in their field on how they operate and get the job done. At the end of the day, we want to be our best. We're going to help provide the information, the data, and the science of how to achieve that mentally, physically, and spiritually. Let's go! go! Next guest on the Operator Podcast is Laura Brady, founder and president of Concierge Auctions, an international luxury real estate auction firm based out of Austin, Texas. In the last eight years, she's driven the business to over a billion dollars in sales and placement on Inc. Magazine's list of the fastest growing companies in America. Laura has been featured in many top publications and news channels, ranging from CNBC Money, Bloomberg, Today Show, Financial Times, Wall Street Journal, and New York Times, amongst many others. She was voted one of the top 100 most influential people in real estate. Laura is a mother of three and a wife and a tremendous person. She was an awesome and an honor to interview and just knowing where she's taking this company. Really just getting into her story over the last eight years, going through the Great Recession and her resolve and commitment to taking this business to an online platform that she's operating today. Their future looks brighter than ever. I love your necklace. Thank so you. we're going to start there. And <laughs> what is the story behind that thing? Because it is amazing. There's nothing too important about it. Okay. Um, well, so I guess I, I have a lot of different necklaces because in different interviews, I can often wear the same type of simple outfit, but just change my necklace. Perfect. So, that is... I, I do a lot of press stuff for my company. Yeah. So that's one thing that I invest in is just kind of costumey jewelry, but it's there's nothing special about it necessarily. yeah but that's a unique tip i think for you know entrepreneurs that want to sure. change up their game and do it with jewelry yeah um you know ladies um it's a good way to think about it invest like in good basic clothes a good pair of shoes and simple solid clothes and then you know accent it with jewelry i think somebody <laughs> wants to come in the podcast we're Hello. shooting a podcast is it emergency okay. love you baby <laughs> it's my it's my wife Oh, yes. My son Aww. just learned how to ride his bike. Awesome. So he's really proud of it. Awesome. We created this template for him. So I asked them, we're doing a thousand rep push-up program over nine weeks where you develop your push-ups. Okay. And, we, and there's a kids program um, for 250 push-ups and you develop it nine weeks and it's like building momentum week by week, increasing your repetitions. And I asked my son if he wanted to participate and he flat out said no. And the goal, because what he wanted was um, little Lego ninjas. Okay. And um, his buddy has four of them, and he wants them. We said, well, we're trying to imprint, you know, you have to practice and work to obtain something and a value mm-hmm. versus you just get it and it shows up. Sure. And so I said, hey, let's do push-ups. He said, no. I said, okay. Um, well, what would you like to do? And he said, I want to ride my bike. And so I said, this was about six weeks ago. I said, okay, if you ride your bike, you can get ninjas. Okay. And we didn't really set parameters around it. Um, and it was about six weeks went by that he didn't ride. And then he set on, I don't know, like, he's like, I'm ready to ride my bike, you know? And uh-huh. so no training wheels, because he used to ride with training wheels. And um, we took those off about a year ago, and he kind of quit riding. And so he said, three days of riding your bike, then you'll get a ninja. And so he rode Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. So we went to Lego store on Monday and got him a Ninja, and he was just so fired up. <laughs> yeah. But they only sell them in four packs. And so um, what I said is like, okay, next time is when you ride six times, you'll get your second Ninja. And it just doubles six, 12, 24, mm-hmm. um, and you can have all four of them. And now he's like rabid about riding his bike. Awesome. And the coolest thing about us sharing with Nicole with the Ninja is he, you know, iPads become addictive and we try to limit screen time. Yep. And and it's so crazy how kids are just like, I want my iPad. And the other night I was showing Nicole that he said, I want, can I watch a video? And said, why don't you play with your Ninja? And it's the first time as he's four and a half that he just lit up and he can play with his toy. Mm-hmm. And it like totally got him broken from wanting the iPad, which Great. was 
was so cool. And it's something that he earned through doing something. So it's he's even more proud of it. And right. Proud to play with oh, it. Yeah. Probably. He How old is he it. now? He is. He turns five. Um, Sorry, September 29th. Okay. My, his birthday, my wedding, and my birthday are all five days from one another. Oh, so wow. So it kind of blurs. But uh-huh. it's September 29th, he turns five. Okay. So. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a good age to have no training wheels. My girls aren't there yet. They're about to turn four. But yeah. they're on balance bikes right now. Yeah. yeah. It's fun. And that's the cool thing with kids that I've learned with Jacob is they're going to develop and come into their own whenever they're ready. Mm-hmm. You know, and there's no necessary for pushing or pulling. It's just like, hey. We, there's the option here it is if when you're ready you'll choose it or not you know That's it's right. kind of been our philosophy with him specifically you know every kid is ob- obviously very different mm-hmm. um so we might have a different approach with our daughter but mm-hmm. well enough about that that was like a side tangent <laughs> but um i mean you're on fire okay so let's not be joking around you are succeeding wildly crazy right now and i know this past year you were honored with a few different accolades correct what were those tell me about it so well thank you first off i mean everything comes with hard work that's for sure and a lot of new challenges every day so i'm sure we'll get into some of those um some of the awards i've received recently um i was named for the third year in a row to a list of the most influential people in real estate in the united states so that was exciting that's big yes it was big um so both my partner who owns the business with me and i were both on the list so that was pretty cool um and let's see other things i was recently in the um new york real estate journal i was profiled as a woman business and trying to think of what other awards my company's been um had a lot of awards lately we've been on the inc magazine's list of fastest growing companies in the united states for the past three years which has been um, a really fun adventure we've been growing a lot um, geographically with our business the reach um, of areas that we're operating as well as with our employee count um, and obviously the volume of business that we're doing year over year so that's helped us get on that list that's so awesome so like that's a good segue just kind of getting where you were as a realtor and transitioning into your business idea and the combination of your past and and technology so just share with us about you know your current or your story of how you got to where you are sure so my company is concierge auctions and we are a luxury real estate auction company so we sell high-end residential properties around the world through a mobile bidding application so buyers can go on to our app we work with real estate agents and sellers to list properties that we market and then enable bidders to bid for the home as opposed to the traditional way of just coming to a home and making an offer and how this came about was um, I was selling real state in Florida in fact I went to UT here in Austin grew up in South Texas and after going to UT I went into retail merchandising I worked corporately for the Neiman Marcus group but after a few years doing that um, office job nine to five you know working for someone else just wasn't really for me I certainly can do it and you know I'm happy working for other people but I've always had this entrepreneurial drive and wanting to build something myself and be able to be accountable to myself um so with that um I got into commercial real estate in Dallas for a while before my husband was offered a job in in Florida Anyway, long story short, I stumbled into selling real estate um, in Florida with my business partner who I own the company with now. And in Florida, it was a very interesting time. When I first moved there in 2004, the market was gangbusters. The, everything would sell. If you put a property on the market, it would sell very quickly at any price point. Um, so I easily navigated into selling luxury properties, um, which of course have the greatest return for a real estate agent. When you sell a home that's three or five or $10 million, you get a great commission. But with that also comes um, a higher level of investment needed and a higher level of of business acumen and execution when you are listing these properties and having to pay for them to be marketed through time before you get a payback. Um, so anyway, the market at that time was great and um, really kind of a monkey could have sold real estate in Florida in 2004, but then 2005 rolled around and we started to watch the market change and the inventory levels were increasing, meaning there were a lot more properties for sale on the market and the sales levels were decreasing. So there became this big um, you know, differential between 
absorption um, properties just were not being sold like they, mm -hmm. they used to be. And so this started, obviously this was seen in the rest of the US in 2008, but in 2005, we started watching the trends in Florida. So my business partner and I started looking into alternative ways to sell homes um, on a more accelerated, more certain basis. And that's how we came upon the auction format. Um, so that's kind of a long-winded, not super long-winded story, because there's a lot more to it, but that's how we got into what we do today. Yeah, it's so it's so interesting, and I think the one thing that comes to mind is is thinking grow rich in the sense of this horrible you know market spawned into an opportunity. Yes, and through the auction process and learning that and navigating, so I'm really interested in what was the movie that just came out where the the market crash and um, it was the last couple of years and they went to Florida to check out the, the oh yeah uh, the big short the big short yes it was so interesting it was so so true that was the space of, <laughs> yes. that you were operating in so yes. so you know with the advancement from 2004 2005 the crash uh, great recession in 08 um, with technology coming online and that's where you bridged the gap yes. of you know, being on them in the field, being in the trenches, looking at auctions, and then online. And that is a small window of opportunity. Mm -hmm. And so with you and your partner, what what was it that was the difference for y'all to transition? And, you know, people's, there's all purchasing norms and all that stuff that has to come into that window for your business to accelerate. Yes. So yes. how did you predict the market or see the market and transition online to leverage? So we, in fact, rolled out a digital bidding platform where bidders could participate online in 2010. Before that, all of our auctions were conducted live with an auctioneer and with people coming to the room and raising their paddles. In 2010, we rolled out this digital bidding, but what we found was that many more people still wanted to come and bid in person. We were, in fact, early to the game mm -hmm. to be purchasing properties of this price point online at that time. So 2010, it was a bit of a crash and burn scenario where we invested a lot um, into this digital capability and nobody adopted it. People still wanted to call in or be there in person. So we knew there was something to it, but the time was not right. So we closed that down and we went back to bidding in person with the paddles. You can call in, um, but you need some sort of physical presence. We decided to reapproach the digital bidding in 2015, at the end of 2015, yes. So all through last year, 2016, we were moving from having physical auctions into the digital bidding platform. We thought at first that perhaps in 2016, 30% of our business would go to the digital platform, but very quickly, 100% of it by the end of last year. So 2016, the time was right. Everybody's used to doing other things and um, you know, investing and, and spending money digitally otherwise, the Uber effect, of course. And so that made it very simple. And we still get the question, you know, do people really buy these, you know, Again, they're five million, ten million dollar homes that people are buying, you know, at the swipe of their finger on their their mobile bidding app. And yes, they do, and they in fact enjoy it more than being in person because it's more convenient for them. There's a lot of, I mean, it's anonymous, so our clients value their privacy and anonymity. Um, so it worked out really well. But as far as having um, kind of the view of when the right time was and um, you know, how to jump forward and do something new like that. I'm pretty blessed that my business partner, he has a crystal ball. <laughs> he can basically, he sees things in the future before other people see them. Um, so he and I are great partners. Um, I'm very much an executor. I, I help make things happen. Um, and Chad's a visionary. I, I have to sometimes come to seeing his vision alongside him. Um, so anyway, that that's important in a business operation. I really believe strongly in partnership in business. Um, I have a lot of friends who are singles at the top of their businesses, and, and that can be lonely. It can be confusing. And um, I do enjoy having a partner that we can shoot ideas off of. Not always agree, but, um, you know, have constructive um, you know, arguments or discussions sometimes too. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. with the breakneck speed of growth, because I mean, so from a financial perspective, 
y'all are growing at 100%, at 500%, at 1,000%. What is the per, <laughs> no. what is the percentage of growth y'all have had over the last three years? So on average, our growth has been pretty controlled. Our average growth has been 30 to 50% a year. So that has been a blessing to us, I believe. We have been constrained on our growth because thus far we've never taken on outside capital. So we've been growing purely on the profitability of our business. And with that, we've had to make very wise decisions and not overspend um, and kind of not get ahead of our skis. And that's been really a good thing in hindsight, looking back, we're now in our, going into our 10th year of business and um, having that controlled growth um, has been helpful to us. Now, are we giving up opportunity or have we in the past years we do think that we have given up some opportunity there are a lot of clients who want to use us but we don't have the the bandwidth um to grow so so quickly so um anyway that is something that we're considering for the future maybe some more exponential growth yeah you know but it's so interesting in this day and age i mean y'all are anomaly into itself being a technology company not telling taking outside investment y'all are showing massive revenue growth mm -hmm. showing profits that that is now is the trend is to start an app show no profit right. you're looking at um twitter or um looking at what is the other thing all the kids use these days snapchat yeah, the, the um, twitter and Sna the yeah the twitter the snapchat <laughs> but it's just so ironic i think it was last quarter you know um, Snapchat lost $2.2 billion and it's just like right. mind boggling. And so it's kind of like, you know, on a level of a multi million dollar company, you're still essentially bootstrapping, following fundamental practices of business, right. is reaping and sowing and growing. And so it's such a counter. But if you look at the width and depth of business over the last you know, 40 years, what you're doing is a proven success plan to have foundational strength and success so y'all can continue to grow into the future. Yes. And it's not a whirlwind of hoping that you can turn this platform into a profitable space, but moving. So I, I congratulate you on that. And I Thank think you. that it's unique in this mm -hmm. time because I look around at entrepreneurs that have taken multi-million dollars of investment, but have no profit and aren't showing a profitability position for years to come. That's, That's right. not a successful business. I can't run my business that way. Right. But that is a market, you know, that is occurring right now, which is just. Sure. Is, it's, uh, it's, you know, counterintuitive to way that business is supposed to operate and work. That's right. And there's huge risk there because as a business owner, if you are op operating with little profitability, you're really looking for the come in the future of being able to sell that business or, you know, eg have some sort of exit strategy where someone else values the future potential of the business, even if it's not profitable today. Mm -hmm. And we've come from a place where we've wanted to maintain profitability so we can take, um, you know, money home every day, but still have, have a healthy business business. Um, so we've focused not just on revenue on the top line of the dollars that are coming into the company, but also on EBITDA, which is the bottom line, you know, after taxes and, and all of the costs are paid. Um, so we've wanted to make sure that we have that bottom line profitability too. That's so great. So with this breakneck speed of growth over the last three years, there has to be stresses, there has to be challenges. It's not like, oh, we showed up, we created a platform, it was uber successful, and we just drink martinis at the pool. That's right. <laughs> right? So it's like, okay, so like, talk to me about some of those challenges that you faced over the last three years in scaling, team member hiring, sure. developing, what? Oh my gosh, there's so many of them. Where do I start? Let's start with your top three. Um, okay, <laughs> so challenges, I think the first challenge is just personal care. So many business owners or operators, or even, I mean, just people just working in general in society today, we don't think about ourselves first very often. And so there's a lot of opportunity to run yourself you know, into the ground health-wise, mentally, um, et cetera, and forget that you know your body's the most important part that's the only body that you're going to get for your life so um, I've had a lot of um, input from mentors on that in the past three years that has been really influential to me because in the first six years of this business I worked crazy hours I mean there were weeks where I worked 20 hour days you know every day to try to keep the business going and that just was not sustainable so um, I've had to step back and and 
take more time to myself. And so that's been one of the biggest challenges. And the second would be, I'd say employee growth, because with employee growth comes um, a responsibility, huge responsibility, financial responsibility to um, to be paying their salaries and you know the, the money that helps them live and cares for their family. Um, second responsibility to take care of them on a, you know, again, a life and happiness level. Most people are spending more time at work today than they do with their families at home. So making sure that the workplace is happy um, and that we hire employees that are inspiring to each other. And that's a really difficult um, thing as a manager and a business owner is, you know, that the Netflix idea of um, firing fast if someone doesn't doesn't fit and uh, fight for people that you want to keep. But for those that you wouldn't fight for, they shouldn't be there anyway. Um, that's hard, especially for um for people who have a lot of compassion, I tr like I, I do try to make people work if they if it's not working out, I try to figure out is there a way to adjust their job description or change things like to, to help them fit. But sometimes people just aren't the right fit. Um, so that's a really difficult thing when it comes to, to employees. And there are breaking points um, in a lot of businesses with employee count. Um, a lot of companies say that 50 employees is a breaking point. I think that 25 for our company was a breaking point where not breaking necessarily, but there was certainly a shift in the culture and business operations when we got above 25 people. Um, it gets to be, again, much, much more of like an operation than um, or a larger team than like a family. Um, so we have we have a really great group right now. We're up to about, I think, 65 um, people that work for us. And uh, we're really proud of, of everyone. Um, with that also has come, I guess, a third part, um, a difficult thing, um, which I guess there's positive and negative to this. But as you hire more employees, you then give up responsibilities, right? Because um, you're having to delegate more and more things. I have had to delegate through the years, which I've had to learn to do. <laughs> I've always been one of these people to take everything onto my own plate and try to get it done. Um, so I've gotten much better at delegating, gotten much better at understanding that everyone is better at something that I do than I am, right? So we've hired experts that now do a lot of the jobs that I used to do when we were a company of three. Um, so that's, that's invigorating to see. Um, but sometimes it's hard for me to remember that I should be the one above the trees watching the business grow and helping to direct the business instead of being in the business. And I do enjoy getting my hands dirty, so sometimes I like getting back into the business, but mm -hmm. sometimes that's not um, the best use of my time. And again, I'm not an expert at most of what we do now as much as a lot of the people we hired now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I wanna go in two different directions. I do wanna talk about you being a mom. Okay. Because that's a whole other category yes, yes so let's just go there and just tell us because in your growth you have children yeah so as an entrepreneurial mother and you know a, an operator what is your official title at Fa uh, president and founder okay so being the president and founder mm -hmm. and and you're talking about the growth so let's just get into family and like how how that has been a part of this journey sure well you mentioned a second ago like as a business owner i can't just sit back and drink martinis or whatever it was that you said it made me made me think that this past weekend was memorial day weekend and we went on a family vacation and my husband made a comment of oh you know why don't you have another pina colada or something like that and i'm like not only can i not rest when i'm on vacation um from rest from work but now we have kids right i can't just sit around and drink pina coladas i'm trying to keep three kids alive around a swimming pool um so definitely like work doesn't end when the business work day ends mm -hmm. right for all of us who are parents um one thing that i keep in mind a lot going back to like taking care of myself is that there to me i get the question a lot of this work life balance or work family balance but to me there are three parts um of that it's it's more triangular than just two pieces there's yourself and your work and your family because again when I go home to my family I'm not taking care of myself necessarily as much either because I'm pouring all that I can into my children um, but I certainly love motherhood I've always 
um, since I was a child, loved children and um, taking care of children. So it's been a huge um, blessing in my life to have my kids. And I do have to always remind myself about perspective that um, I love my business and I love my family. So to me, I think about it as um, a rhythm. We have to all, you know, stay in rhythm. It's not every day is not balanced. Some days the rhythm is beating more for my family and some days it's beating more for the business. And I just have to, you know, go along with it and, and focus um, my efforts where I can every day. Mm -hmm. um, luckily, we have a lot of love and a lot of help around our family. My husband is super helpful with the children, which I don't know how I could do what I do without um, his support at home and um, extended family. Um, as well as great caretakers and, and schools for them. So I, I feel really comfortable that I can, you know, get away and for time for myself or for time for work and still have my, my children cared for. Mm -hmm. And so just, you have twins, don't you? I do. Okay. I, and yes. so you have three children. I do. And yes. so you have twins and I have twin. just to get perspective, because I really want people to know. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, I have twin three-year-olds well they're yes. almost four and they're girls and then I have a seven-month-old girl also yeah so um, we are we're very busy and the twins um, came during you know well I guess my life with my business has been busy every day for the past nine years but they came during a very busy time and and you know that my daughter did too the the third one uh, Parker but you know the the truth be told there is just no great time to decide to have children um, if you want to have them I believe just just have them and time you know will figure itself out um, I personally waited quite a while before having children. My husband and I thought we wanted to get this business going and do some traveling. Um, and then we had challenges getting pregnant with the twins. So, um, you know, in hindsight, I maybe should have taken my advice sooner of just, you know, let's go for it. But everything works out perfectly. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, they're really great kids. And I, I do enjoy that they see me um, you know, going after my dreams, not only at home, but also at work, because work is really fulfilling to me. Mm -hmm. In fact, last night with um, with their prayers, one of them said, thank you for mommy's work. <laughs> and That's I good. hadn't I hadn't taught her that. She just said, thank you, God, for mommy's work. <laughs> That's so neat. So, yeah. Well, I now want to pivot again and move to pre business. And, you know, for just from a childhood perspective, because you really from my standpoint sitting across from you here you're really destined for greatness like you just don't happenstance into neiman marcus management and then into real estate success so like what was it like for you growing up what was your family life like where did this switch go off on you for you to really pursue excellence and success yeah well thank you for that um i don't know if it's destiny as much as i just have I don't know, I've always had this drive and I have been very lucky to have been surrounded by inspiring people. Mm -hmm. So as far as my life growing up, um, I have a very strong um, background of females in my life. Um, I never considered myself at a disadvantage being a female in business or in anything. Um, my grandmother on my mom's side, um, her husband passed away, my grandfather, before I was born, and my grandmother assumed his um, the operation of his oil and gas business. So she was very much an entrepreneur. She had you know news on TV every single time I walked into her house and was always doing a crossword puzzle. And she w always wanted to hear everything about my life and my business, and as she did her other twelve grandchildren. So um, that was inspiring. My mom is one of three. She has two other sisters. Um, they're all inspiring in themselves. My mom has always been an entrepreneur she's had a lot of different small businesses and she's been in real estate um, investing in real estate and developing real estate my whole life so that's how I got the real estate bug I suppose um, and as was that grandmother my mom's mom she was she owned rental properties and was collecting rent from her tenants until she was 89 years old driving around collecting rent so um, that was inspiring on my dad's side my grandmother um, was a war bride she grew up in Europe and she moved here with my grandfather who was a US soldier and they met in Europe he taught her to speak English she moved here and ended up speaking five languages and teaching four of them at a high school level and graduating from UT in the 50s so um, Anyway, I just always had that real powerful um, 
inspiration around me. And then personally, I don't, I really don't know where the drive in me has come from to just do everything that I do as well as I can do it. So I, and I guess it can be a detriment. Sometimes I am, you know, just so headstrong. Um, and, but I, it's, it's helped me through life to always be, um, inspired in school. I loved school, um, especially always loved science and math. And my two brothers did too. So um, they're both academics, actually. My brothers both um, studied till PhDs. So um, we all kind of have this uh, love for academia inside of us. That's so awesome. And I know that um, a former guest of ours that was on, Matt Grishard, I know you go yes, to Lake Hills. I do. And his wife, Julie, is uh, also someone that speaks into your life. Um, so what's that dynamic from a faith standpoint in your family life, in your work life? How does that kind of help you gov govern, you know, what you do? Sure. So I grew up in a faithful family, but my family, um, or and my family is Catholic, so I grew up in Catholicism, and always had that as part of my life. Um, then I deepened my faith really more in high school and college. I got into youth groups and Bible studies um, that helped me also to learn more about the Bible than I feel like I had within the Catholic faith. Um, so, and I don't know if that was just because of my experience in the churches that we grew up in, but the, the youth groups and Bible studies really helped me delve in more mm -hmm. uh, into the Word of God. And now, I suppose I've gotten stronger in my faith, or not suppose, I have, um, since I had children, too. So, you know, I kind of... Um, I didn't stray from the church necessarily, but I wasn't as um, committed to a church family as we were starting to grow this business. We were moving a lot. We just didn't find really a church home um, until moving back to Austin three years ago and getting plugged in again to LHC, Lake Hills Church, which is where Mac and Julie Richard are. Um, in fact, I went to Lake Hills Church when I was in college here at UT and it was just starting. Mm -hmm. So when we moved back three years ago, it was fun to see that at the church that we had been to when it was less than 50 people is now, you know, this huge church with a beautiful campus and, and huge impact on the Austin area. Um, and I, in fact, I haven't, you mentioned um, Julie pouring into me, Julie Richard. I have not been able to attend her Fearless Moms events that she does at Lake Hills Church, but they're hugely un influential to hundreds of mothers. And I listen to the to the podcasts um, because I, I don't go in person and I'm actually, I have a backlog of them. So um, yeah. that that's a really great, um, uh, I guess, study that, that she does to teach mothers how to have faithful families. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I know last time we met up, you just got done with your personal trainer. So you, I know you have a trainer, you've yes. had one for a while. So yes. we, we really think about from our podcast is operating your business, operating your spiritual life, operating your physical fitness and how has that fitness and wellness played into your success in taking care of yourself it's been huge um i haven't even i have maybe even haven't been as committed to it as i should be i go to a trainer twice a week but other than that i, I live a healthy lifestyle so but i i started going to a trainer personally when i was um getting, trying to get pregnant before the twins. So five years ago. Um, and then I trained through both of my pregnancies in order to, you know, have the, you know, the right, um, the right mind and body through the pregnancies and afterwards. So, you know, lately I've been with the same trainer for a year and a half and, um, I'm very committed to it. And as a, business operator it's something to me working with a trainer and having a set time that I'm accountable to and I'm the only person you know that shows up and so I have to show up and I go in the middle of the business day so that I get out of the office and uh, clear my head a little bit and um, yeah it's that's been trans transformative to me um, otherwise just eating well and working out to me it makes every other part of my life run more smoothly I want to eat better you know I want to take care of myself more when I come off of you know the high of of having a good workout so mm -hmm. so with everything I mean you're a studet, if you will. I mean, I'm just listening to you, getting inspired. I need to come do this podcast I mean, every morning. <laughs> I'm just like, oh my goodness, you're you're really a rock star in in 
you know, from a personal standpoint, what is some, what would be like some of your personal, um, I want to say not like secrets, but just kind of practices that you know are very powerful for you <laughs> that maybe someone might not know about you that like is like this really sets things apart for me. I know we've covered a lot. But is there anything there that you know <clears throat> that you really um, do that you're like, if I didn't do this, I couldn't be at the level that I'm at? Well, when you say that people don't know about me, the things that I think about at first, most people do know about me if, they, if they're close to me. Um, I, I think that I'm a fairly open book as far as you know how I operate um, personally. My number one thing, which is a core of our culture at, at Concierge Auctions, is composure. And so I feel very strongly about taking every experience that we have, you know, with, um, how do I explain it? Um, Just keeping a sense of composure no matter what is going on around you. So um, absorbing things with a sense of reality that we, we can't worry about you know, things that we can't affect. And also if people are being too, um, we work with a lot of aggressive, you know, high personality clients and real estate agents and trying to like level with people and take things, you know, down a notch is something that's important to me. To me with my daughters, one thing I tell them when they leave home to go to school every day is to be peacemakers. So I want them to, and to me, that's kind of their the composure piece goes into that too. I, I mean with that is to be kind and if other people are being unkind to you, you know, be a peacemaker back to them. Um, and that's kind of the same that's feeling so in the office of, of composure. Now my husband will say that I do worry a lot and I overthink things a lot. So again, I'm not perfect at it. I have to remind myself to be composed very often. Um, but I think that just the world would be a much more you know peaceful place if we could all level with each other and, and be a little more calm instead of getting you know wound up about things that might not even matter much mm-hmm. so that I, I love that you talk about that within the company and with a how many employees did you say now y'all are about 65 65 so from the dna and the culture of your company how would how would you formulate that or what is some of the basic you know tenets of y'all's company from a cultural standpoint so other key tenants that we have are to be cutting edge so we are blazing a new trail with in our industry um with selling real estate in a different way um and by the way we're going against the grain of the two million real estate agents in the united states we work alongside them um we're a tool for them but we can be seen sometimes as threatening um so anyway being cutting edge and that's with our technology too always trying to think of of the next thing that's coming up um being committed so once you take on a task you know being committed to it and and following it through um agent friendly is our other uh core value and composure and then at the very end of our core values we have a hashtag and exclamation point and between that make history so we want everybody within their own role as well as with the company as a whole to make history so if you are a programmer you know coming up with some new code to do something on our site that has never been done before making history you know if you're a marketing person you know coming up with new taglines or creating a new ad that's innovative that's making history um sales obviously achieving the highest price point sale that's ever been achieved in a certain market is making history so um every day we think about that and and preach that around the office man hashtag make history <laughs> that's so good nicole do you have any other questions Okay. Cool. So I'll reframe our producer's question is who you look up to mm-hmm. and who inspires you. Mm-hmm. So growing up, I mentioned my family looking up to the other females in my family um, was definitely big for me. Um, as far as inspiration, I mean, I'm inspired every day by so many different people. Um, I read a lot of books. Um, Brene Brown is one author that I really love. Um going to church is super inspiring to me and being surrounded by, you know, other faithful, positive people. Um, my business partner, Chad is inspiring to me. Um, wouldn't have been working with him for 
14 years, I think now, if, if he wasn't an inspiration, um, all of my employees are inspiring. Um, and personally, I have a mentor in Barbara Corcoran. She, um, she sold her real estate group, the Corcoran Group, and a lot of people know her now from Shark Tank. Um, she's an advisor to our business, and she's also become um, a mentor to me. Um, so she is one who has really helped me to focus more on myself when I mentioned kind of having a turning time three years ago to be more focused on um, taking care of myself and not running myself into the ground. <laughs> um, Barbara was really involved in that with me. Um, she actually had, had my business partner, Chad, sign a handwritten contract that he would let me take more time away from the office for myself. <laughs> and not that he was against that, but he said he agreed with that. And she was like, OK, if you agree, then sign here. Let's write it down right now. So and he was in agreement. But, um, you know, I think that we all need people around us that help us level um, ourselves in life and um, not be too serious or too headstrong about just one facet of life, because I think that that's where you get you might get lost, mm -hmm. um, forgetting about having blinders on and forgetting about the world around you. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. We're so appreciative of you coming on. Is there anything else you would like to add or any like direct correlation to your business or anything? I know the last thing, you know what just popped up is I know y'all are starting a new charitable oh, yes. operation within mm -hmm. y'all's organization. So mm -hmm. share with us what y'all are doing from that standpoint. We have partnered with a company called Give Back Homes and they are an a, a movement for social change within the real estate community. So they work with real estate agents and title companies, anyone who's involved with real estate, to try to apportion part of your proceeds for charity. Um, namely, they build homes for families in need. So Give Back Homes is based out of LA, and we have built homes with them through the past few years. We've done a, a couple homes. This year, we decided to take a more um, influential stance with them, and for every home that we're we're selling now through the balance of 2017, we're going to donate a home to a family in need. So this year alone will be um, about 100 homes that we will be building. And last year we built one home with them in Nicaragua and sent a team down there who came back you know, hugely influenced by that experience. Um, it's an area that is very in need of safe, uh, healthy housing. And so we are going to be building all 100 homes in the same neighborhood in Nicaragua, or we're building a neighborhood, I suppose. Um, and one cool thing about Give Back that I love for anyone who wants to get involved is that they, in fact, give you the information about the families that you are building the homes for. Um, and you can choose the family if you wanna see a group of them and choose who to contribute to. But now in our office, for every house that we sell, we announce the family that is going to be receiving a home and the biography of them and the photos of them. So we, we have a wall that's gone up in our office where you can see all of the families. Um, and really heart-touching stories, the reasons why these families were chosen to get homes. That's so, so awesome. Yeah, thank awesome. you. Awesome. Well, it was a pleasure to have you. Thank you for having me. It Absolutely. was a lot of fun. Thank you for joining us on the Operator Podcast. Please join us on our virtual platforms, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and we will see you soon.